My guest is award-winning pianist Emmanuel Axe, who will be performing in the Artemis W. Ham Concert Hall at the UNLV Performing Arts Center this Thursday, April 20th at 7.30 p.m. For ticket information, go to pac.unlv.edu. And for everything about Emmanuel Axe, go to emmanuelaxe.com. And you can follow him on Twitter at Emmanuel Axe. And Emmanuel, welcome to the show. Thank you. Nice to see you. Same here. When did you know you wanted to live the classical life? Oh, I'm not sure. Uh, I think it came gradually. And I think I was about 14 when I decided that I couldn't do anything else decently. So I would try playing the piano. <laughs> <laughs> but then, of course, you could play the piano and do something else as well. You could drive Uber or Lyft and play. That's piano. true. But in those in those days, in those days, there was no Uber or Lyft. <laughs> Good point. True. <laughs> yeah. So in those when I was a, when I was a young man, you could uh, either play the piano or uh, I don't know, uh, I Become suppose play the violin. <laughs> yeah, there you go. And how did you decide on the piano versus the violin? Uh, I think it was because when when I was about seven, uh, we were still in the Soviet Union. And we had from previous tenants, there was a little piano, sort of a little, very small upright left over from them. And I kind of liked plucking on it. Uh, we had no other instruments. It was the, and everyone studied an instrument. So uh, that's that's what I wound up doing. And you end up in Canada, but then of course you move to the United States at some point and you start to yeah. enter competitions. Was that a cultural adjustment for you coming from the Soviet Union to Canada and then to, to the United States? Oh, of course, it was an enormous, enormous, especially technological explosion for me. I was, we went, when I was seven, we went from... Uh, Soviet Union to Poland, because my parents were Polish. When I was 10, we wound up going from behind the Iron Curtain to Winnipeg, Canada. And I had never seen a car that looked any any other than a 1930s Hudson or something. <laughs> and, and, you know, those were those were the days when I was 10. Those were the days of tail fins. Right. If you remember those cars, <laughs> yes. it was just an amazing thing. My first television... My first toaster that I ever saw, where the bread came up all by itself, it was it was miraculous. For the kids, it was a miracle. Yeah. <laughs> and I would imagine I know there were some things in the Soviet Union they did they did make a car, but it was a fairly uh, how she would say uniform car. It just had, yeah yeah it was all it was all things that 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 you you know that they were just decades behind. In fact, right. And so, so for for a ten year old kid, uh, the technology that that existed in the West was just astonishing. People always have this perception that people who perform classical music, whether as part of an orchestra or the piano, are very serious, and they are very serious musicians. But they can also have a sense of humor, and they can be down to earth. Why is there this disconnect where they pe they think that classical musicians are different from any other kind of musicians? I'm sorry to hear that, and I know that that's probably true a lot of the time, and I think a lot of us are trying to change that. You know, if you see Itzhak Perlman in concert or on television, he's one of the funniest people alive. He's he's like Robin Williams was, you know? Yo-Yo <laughs> uh, uh, Ma, my, who's a friend of mine, uh, an old, old friend and close friend, is one of the most entertaining people alive. Uh, all my jokes come from other other <laughs> musicians, so uh, I don't I don't know why. Uh, I I guess I guess because the trappings of classical music up to now have been, I think, unfortunately, kind of off putting. Uh, tailcoats, not applauding between movements frowning on people who, you know, all kinds of totally irrelevant behavior at concerts that have nothing to do with music. And we're all trying to change that. I really think so. Excellent. I think that's a great idea because I, that was going to be one of my questions, but in fact, you answered it without me even asking it, which is the, how do you expand the universe of classical music? And I think what you just said makes a lot of sense. Make it more. Well, it's, it's certainly one way to start, you know, the, 
the best way to expand uh, love of the music that I love, I think, is to be able to give every kid in the world an instrument to play. And of course, it's also it's tough these days because it takes it takes a lot of effort to play an instrument. It's it's a long process. And I think we are in an age where there's so much that you can do as a kid. Uh, computers, Internet, games uh, that are readily accessible and, and wonderful. It's not nothing wrong with them, you know, but it's it's different uh, to play an instrument. And I hope that we can continue getting kids to be excited about the process still. I think it also involves discipline, which is harder these days. And for someone, I suppose, yeah, although, although I do, I do think a lot of kids have discipline just in different areas. You know, there's, I, I, I happen to be a big sports nut, uh, especially we love watching tennis, my wife and I, but I'm also a, a, an American football fan and I have a, a team. I've been a long suffering fan for, <laughs> for a number of years now, <laughs> but you know, these people have incredible discipline and a work ethic, which is second to none. So I think in that way, we're very connected. That makes sense. Do you want to reveal the team that you uh, are? Well, I'm a New York Giants fan. Okay, fair enough. <laughs> and and uh, I know I've been watching, I've been watching the Las Vegas Raiders all year with the various dramas that have been going on. <laughs> and I congratulate, I congratulate you on your choice of quarterback. I think he's going to do wonderfully well. I think it'll be great. Do you think there'll ever be a halftime show at a Super Bowl with manual acts? <laughs> In a word, no. <laughs> <laughs> that, would, that would truly be different, wouldn't it? <laughs> that would be oh, sure. that would be very different. Yes, <laughs> yes. And I think rather off-putting, to be honest. Ah, <laughs> oh, but what a what a great moment that would be. So <laughs> I think I'll put in a little word to the what team. A, team what a wonderful idea. <laughs> <laughs> it's never been done. So I thought, you know why? No, not? no, no. Well, some <laughs> things have never been done for a reason, probably. <laughs> <laughs> you're probably right. You know, something about classical music, and you're the perfect person to ask, why is classical music both technical and emotional because i think some people see it as very technical but not emotional but it's clearly emotion yeah well it certainly is to me right uh, i i think i think the music that i play tells wonderful stories and the thing that i love about music that i play which is not words not a script, not is that everyone can make up their own story. So when you hear, when you hear a piece by Beethoven, which to me is always full of hope and triumph and positivity, it might not be the same for someone else. Uh, I I think that's that's the wonderful part about music. You have your own story. You don't have words to tell you. It's the interpretation from the listener. Exactly. Yes. No. It, the listener is as much a part of the performance as I am. Obviously, I practice more than the listener <laughs> yes. does. Yeah. But, but, but I, think, I think without the listener, nothing happens. What's the, and this is, a, I'm sure, a cliche question you've uh, heard before the symbiotic relationship between the orchestra and you as a pianist how is that well, set up for you particularly yeah well uh, of course it depends on the piece that that you're playing uh if you're playing a piece by mozart or beethoven or brahms uh the orchestra and the piano are usually either partners or fighting each other. <laughs> I mean, there's either there's either, a, and I'm talking musically. There's either a compositional battle going on, you know, where one wants to be supreme over the other, and that's intended to be that way. Or there's a collaboration, and sometimes that happens in the same piece. 
In fact, most of the time, you know, in the great in the great concertos, that happens in the same piece. Uh, but if you're doing, for example, a Chopin concerto, which also has a beautiful orchestra part, once the piano starts, it provides a wonderful cushion of sound with a couple of solos here and there for the pianist to almost be a constant primus inter pares, which I think means first among equals. <laughs> <laughs> Do you, which would you prefer, the cooperation, the collaboration, or the clashing? Well, I think you can't you can't escape either. I mean, if right. you're doing, no, no. correct. If you're doing Beethoven or Brahms or Mozart, you're always going to have elements of both. But it, what, of the two, which do you prefer, though? Oh gosh. Uh, well, I <laughs> I love I love cooperating because I'm a very friendly person. On the other hand, I never get to be tough at home. So sometimes <laughs> it's nice to be able to fight with the orchestra. It sharpens your skill too, I would imagine. <laughs> yes. when, when you're in combat. So in in that <laughs> how much practice do you have to do to maintain your level of skill, which is extremely high, obviously? Well, yeah. at this point, I, you know, I'm in my I'm in my seventies now. So I practice about, I don't know, three and a half, four hours a day. And that's about my limit. I'm just too old to do more. <laughs> when I was younger, lot. that's still a lot. It, well, it's every day, you know, and right. of course it's it's my job. Uh, I I used to practice between five and six hours a day. That was a routine. Yeah. That you makes know, sense. When, when I, I was a young person, yeah. Just for the just for the record, you do not look seventy. Well, I do. I look older or younger? Younger. You, oh, that's good to know. You <laughs> look around, to me, you look around 55. That's excellent to know. I wish I felt 55. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the, you look a little bit remember, like, go ahead. You remember the old well, well, Oliver Wendell Holmes, the chief justice of the of the U.S., when he passed the young lady on the street and he said, oh, to be 80 again. <laughs> <laughs> You look like a handsome girl eyes. How's that? that, that would be... Oh, that's lovely. <laughs> do, you, do you see the uh, appeal of classical music growing in the United States or around the world? Well, it's very anecdotal. You know, I, I only see, I don't have statistics or, or, or numbers really, but I see, I see a lot of wonderful audiences now. I, I think there was a period when things were, getting not so good but i think somehow there's been a bit of a resurgence i'm glad to say and, and uh, i hope i hope it continues do you see some generational change as well do you see more younger people in the audiences i see i see a little more young people in the audiences yeah we can always use more right. but of course now that i'm old i sympathize with the old people <laughs> We should point out that uh, I always like the Royal We. We should point out. I should point out that you're a Sony classical exclusive artist, and you've been with them for a long time. What? It, a very. Go sorry, ahead. go ahead. Yeah. No, that's right because we're slightly delayed on on Zoom. That's why we, we have that little disconnect. No, a very a very long time. Yeah, in fact, I I started with with a company that you probably still know called RCA. Yes, with the dog. And, and RCA was bought by Sony. <laughs> Uh, or rather by Columbia Records. So I guess I've been with them from the beginning. <laughs> Excellent. Do you see that there's a major difference when you're recording for Sony? And obviously it's different than performing live at a concert hall. I want to talk to you a little bit about your performance here in Las Vegas in a moment. But when you're performing and you're recording and you know that if you need to, you can re-record in case there's a slight problem or a technical mm -hmm. issue. Whereas oh, yeah. when you're when you're performing live, you're performing live, so there's obviously that difference. But do you get the same emotional satisfaction from recording in the studio versus performing in front of an audience? I think it's a very different process. Honestly, it's it's the the performance in front of an audience is something that that you gear up for, you practice for, you try to be at your best at that very moment. 
and you play no matter what happens, you sail through the piece and you do your best to deliver the message you want, even if there are accidents that happen during the performance. In a studio, in a recording situation, the whole process is you play, you go and listen, and you try to improve or change what you just heard. So it's a very different way of doing things. It's, it's very similar to a performance of live theater or doing a movie. You know, the, the, the movie you set up for 15 takes or whatever it is right. of the exact same scene. And you try to improve each take. In live theater, you try to be at your best at the given moment. It's clear you love life. And the reason I ask that question is the one benefit of a recording is that it makes you immortal. And how do, how do you reflect that? Because you're busy living life, enjoying life, and performing in front of audiences throughout the world. But at the same time, when you're recording for Sony, there's a permanent recording of you that generations later people can enjoy do you ever think about that not very much to be honest okay, so I much more in the now <laughs> yeah no i i don't i don't worry very much about that i'm, <laughs> I'm sure most of my cds will serve as coffee table decoration. <laughs> nice so coasters, i don't right? <laughs> i don't i don't worry about it much no <laughs> okay fair enough so you're coming to las vegas yeah. Be, uh, very enjoyable, but have, it, I don't know what you're going to be performing. So I'm going to ask you that question. Or do you even know what you're going to be performing at that point? Oh, I definitely do. Yes, right. I, I know. Glad exactly somebody what does. I'm performing. <laughs> oh, yes. Uh, because I've been practicing. <laughs> <laughs> Three and a half uh, hours a day. I know. <laughs> I'll be doing I'll be doing music of Schubert. Nice. And, and some some music that's inspired by Schubert in transcriptions by Liszt some songs of Schubert that he arranged for piano alone, and then a piece of Liszt. So it's a kind of Schubert, Schubert Liszt, Liszt, and back to Schubert. Uh, Liszt was a, the, probably almost certainly the greatest pianist of the whole 19th century. Uh, he adored the music of Schubert. So he arranged as much as he could of Schubert's songs, of, of whatever he could lay his hands on, for piano alone and he did amazing amazing arrangements so i'm playing four of those songs on the program Great. and of course the schubert sonata as well they're very close to my heart and i'm i'm happy to be playing that music and i hope people uh, love the music as much as i do clearly the love that you have for the music comes through in your playing and i think audiences are particularly susceptible to reading the emotions of the the musician or the musicians on stage do you get the same sense from your audience that they they get you as well as you get them well i hope so uh i'm certainly aware of the audience you know i'm not just playing for myself and uh i don't know how it is that you're aware of the other people in the building but it happens uh, I, I can't really describe it, but I know it's there. <laughs> it's subconscious, perhaps, in that sense. Yeah, in 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 a way, or or it's some yeah. kind of ESP, or it's uh, I don't I don't know for sure, but definitely when you're playing at home, isn't it's not the same. It's not the same when you're recording. It's one way. When you're performing, it's another. We talked a little bit about that earlier. How important are the acoustics in various performing halls for you? Oh, it's, a, it's, it's nice to have a hall that's conducive to, to good sound. What that is, is again, a mystery a lot of the time. <laughs> there, there are halls that are 130 years old that sound fabulous and were just built without too much consideration of modern acoustic techniques. Uh, and then a lot of halls that were built 40 years ago that just don't work. And I think the science of acoustics has come so far now that that now all the new halls that I've seen have been excellent. So I think, again, science has made huge strides in that respect. 
Are you always surprised when you come to Las Vegas that there's a home here for classical music? I, I say it in one sense. There, there, it, Las Vegas has been exploding in arts and culture in the last 10, 15 years with the Smith Center, the UNLV Performing Arts Center, et cetera. It's not at the level for perhaps of Los Angeles or New York or other mm -hmm. major cities, but can you see the difference in Las Vegas? Well, you know, I've only been to Las Vegas once before. So and that was many, able to see that it. was many years ago. <laughs> okay. And I was completely bowled over by the strip. I think I stayed on the strip. Well, you should. I, I, I played at I played at UN UNLV, but right. but I was I was completely bowled over by, by all of that. And this is only my second time to come. So I'm certainly I'm certainly hoping that there's a, a receptive audience. Uh, I will do my very best to connect as much as I can with people who come to the concert, and uh, I hope a lot of people come. <laughs> do you find out well, because you've obviously interacted with so many people over the years? Do you find out? Uh, do you find that there is a particular? not demographic, but a particular type of person that enjoys classical music? No, no, I don't. Uh, I think one of the things that I've realized over the years is that there's absolutely no, uh, no cultural barriers, no financial barriers, no... I, no, the answer is simply no. no. It's, it's a good, uh, good answer. I like yeah, it. <laughs> yeah, you find people from every possible background and every possible interest who like what you're doing, and people from similar background to yours who couldn't care less about what you're doing. <laughs> so, <laughs> so. <laughs> but from your point of view, what is the appeal? I know, I know we've talked a little bit about this, but I, I'm still fascinated by the subject. What is the appeal in general of classical music to people? As you say, it's it, there's no stereotypical person that enjoys classical music, but there's something about classical music and the music that you play particularly that appeals to people. Have you ever thought about that as to what it is? both from your point of view and from the audience point of view? I know that's a rather cosmic question, but that's what I'm here for. Yeah, I, and I don't I don't actually have an intelligent answer to that. You have an unintelligent uh, one. That would be okay, too. Uh, and I don't even have, I don't even have a, a silly answer. <laughs> okay, uh, fair enough. <laughs> I, I, I think, I think uh, yeah, you'd have to ask somebody who's more of a philosopher. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Yeah. I always thought most classical musicians were philosophers, but that just made me my interpretation. No, no not so, not so much. We're more, <laughs> we're more uh, eaters than anything else. <laughs> you know, people are being bombarded yeah. with entertainment all over the place now. And again, a, a little bit of a philosophical question for you, even though I know you're not a philosopher. But how can people be enticed into the world of classical music, given? really with streaming services and all of the entertainment out there yeah. how do you how do you develop that interest in people i'm i'm hoping that if people hear something they like they will want to pursue it i i don't have a better answer than that uh i'm hoping that that the availability of the beethoven fifth symphony on every possible platform uh from uh you know, from Spotify to uh, YouTube to everything else to Apple Music, you you name it, uh, that there will be some people that will say this is absolutely exciting, wonderful, thrilling, and I'd like to hear more of it. That's the only answer I can give. An organic answer. I like it. What is your favorite piece, and what who is your favorite composer? Uh, I don't know, and I don't know. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Do you have a series of favorite composers and a series of favorite pieces? Oh, I've got a, I've got a whole bunch, but it's much too long <laughs> to list. Okay. <laughs> when you're not practicing three to four hours a day and you're not performing, uh, what do you do with your spare time? Do you do something totally disconnected to the world? I watch, fo I watch football and tennis. Oh, all right. That's good. I, I go for walks. Uh, I read books. Uh, I learn jokes. <laughs> I, 
so uh, nothing, nothing extremely uh, weird. I don't think. <laughs> you know, the, the life of a, a pianist in the classical world is usually fairly long. So I would imagine you see yourself performing into your 80s and perhaps 90s. I, you know, I have no idea. I don't know if I'm going to retire in a month or in a few years. It really depends on whether arthritis hits, yes, <laughs> whether my can. brain goes away, <laughs> uh, whether I just can't travel anymore, you know, just things like that. So I'm I'm hoping to keep playing and, and teaching as long as I can. You, as mentioned, the, as that. you mentioned the teaching. How, how important is that to you? Oh, I love doing it. You know, the kids are the kids that I see now are are incredibly brilliant. They're they're just uh, the the level of of playing has has been increasing over the years, and I I just find I find the kids now so brilliant, and I love hearing them play. I don't often have much to tell them, but uh, maybe a couple of things that'll help. You know, uh, I enjoy it very much. Uh, I hope they're getting something out of it, and and uh, I certainly am. And before I let you go, do you have another recording coming up that you're going to be going into the studio for? Well, we're going to be continuing some recordings that I'm doing with my friend Yo-Yo, Yo-Yo Ma, uh, and another violinist friend, Leonidas Kavakos. We've been recording a lot of Beethoven, and there are some, there are some more trios to record, so I think we'll be doing that in the next couple of years. When you're Still at the, when you're at the level that you're at, is there an ease in performing and in recording, or is it always a little nerve wracking before you start? It's all, it's always nerve wracking. It's always it's always stressful. But uh, I guess that's part of part of life. It's part of life. Well, that's part a good way, yeah, part of life. Well, that's a great way to leave it. My guest has been a, good. A, my guest has been Grammy award winning. Pianist Emmanuel Axe will perform in the Artemis W. Ham Concert Hall at the UNLV Performing Arts Center this Thursday, April 20th at 7.30 p.m. And for ticket information, go to pac.unlv.edu. And for everything about Emmanuel Axe, you can go to emmanuelaxe.com and you can follow him on Twitter at Emmanuel Axe. Emmanuel, thanks for being on the show. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure. See you next time.